after being told to bring it or strongly advised or whatever. Amen. Well, there's a good spirit here tonight. Man, there's a good spirit here tonight. Uh, hallelujah. Um, um, uh, if you weren't here and you'd like to have a copy, I got about ten more copies. Uh, um, Yeah. Okay. Uh, this somebody help a brother out. Hey, Brother Terry. You offered a while ago. I'll take you up on it now. Everybody's got your hand up. Try to give them one uh, if you can. It's difficult for me to make copies like that, so I'm not going to be able to run and do it. Uh, uh, but uh, most, a um, great majority of it we covered last Wednesday. And uh, then... Uh, then uh, we uh, we'll, we'll we'll review for a few moments, and uh, uh, I I'm gonna I'm gonna let you know something. Uh, I, I've been very very troubled in my spirit over the last uh, uh, the last few weeks. As a matter of fact, then Sunday morning we had leadership class. And uh, about half of them played hooky on me. Matter of fact, exactly half. Uh, some of them uh, just plain forgot, like Sister Leanne. I mean, <laughs> and then others, I suppose. You know, life life gets heavy sometimes, and 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 what have you. But we spoke in there and out here about the same thing and uh, uh, here's the frustrating thing about it for me as your pastor is we're going to have a safe place here come hell or high water it's going to be safe in here But you have to let it be. And we've got into some bad habits of isolating ourselves when we're going through something. It makes me want to take my belt off. I mean, really. I remember one time I was going through something terrible in my life. And if some of you were here tonight that forgot to give yours. Yeah, Amanda never did get one and she was too scared. That's exactly what I'm talking about right now. She said she was too scared to say something because somebody would make fun of her or something. <laughs> I would just... But uh, I remember one time I was going through something terrible in my life. The, the worst thing I've ever been through uh, that was of my own making. And I was scared to talk to my daddy about it. And uh, when I finally did talk to him, he was mad. Uh, not, but he was more mad that I was afraid to come to him. Uh, he was more upset that I was afraid to come to him than of what I had involved myself in. So I'm going to tell you right now, take advantage of what the Holy Ghost is doing. Amen. Do not, for goodness sake, do not isolate yourself. I ain't going no further. It doesn't do, listen to me. The Holy Ghost speaks when we preach. And he speaks for a purpose. It's for us to receive it. And we are warned very succinctly and very precisely in Scripture to not be, that if you are a hearer and not a doer, when hell comes loose against you, it's going to knock you off your foundation. Is that not in the book? 
Now, I understand that it takes, some of you are, are uh, isolationist by nature. And I got to tell you the truth. There are times, Brother Ray, moving up in the bottom somewhere like Uncle James used to live is appealing to me sometimes. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, my family thinks I'm a little weird because, I, Brother Rice, I don't mind to travel by myself. I eat by myself all the time, and it acts like it hurts my wife's feelings that I'm eating by myself. It doesn't knock a shuck off of me. It doesn't bother me. If I want company, I'll call and ask for it. But just because that's our nature doesn't mean that we've got to just decide for other people what they get to care about and what they don't. Okay? So, I just felt like I need to say that. You, you're not by yourself. Okay? You're not, you're not by yourself. This is a safe place. Somebody comes to talk to you about something, and I hear about you repeating it, mm mm mm. You, you're just going to destroy their trust. You can't do that. Let it stop with you. If they want it told, let them tell it. I just feel like saying that. You, you don't have to struggle alone. And there's several of you that are struggling. I don't know what it is. I don't know what's going on with you. You know, the Lord shows me a lot of things, but he don't show me everything. But I'm telling you, you don't have to struggle by yourself. Okay? The <laughs> Don't worry, I'll go nuts in a minute. And then everybody will think, whoo, we're back to normal. Um. Uh, I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna to go on and go. We're going to baptize a couple of the, those young ones that receive the Holy Ghost after church after I get through here. So, amen. We want to certainly leave time for that. Amen? amen? The Bible provides very clear principles on how we are to dress and how we are to present ourselves. The Bible does. Everybody say it's the Bible. It's the Bible. Now, we live in a society and even a Christian Society, and I and I say that those that that uh, uh, aspire to the to the Christian ethic, which is namely that Jesus was the Christ uh, in our world, uh, brother Robbie, that like to pick and choose with the Bible, and uh, and we we're not going to do that. I want the Bible to govern each and every part of my life. Amen, amen. I want it to, to to cover every part of my life. And God is concerned with our dress and appearance. Because the way that we dress and the way that we appear are, are you know, we're not going to talk about it too much now, but the way that we half dress or the way that we undress, uh, it, it, it presents a certain message to those that are looking at us. And the Bible's very clear in 1 Samuel chapter number 15 or 16, I believe it is, that man looks on the outward appearance. Okay? So we are representing God in everything that we do, and he is concerned with our dress, with our appearance, because it makes a statement of our values, and it communicates some things. And the Bible speaks about modesty very clearly, moderation in style and cost. It speaks to avoid ornamentation. And then, of course, always to maintain gen gender distinctives. There are clothes for men and there are clothes for women. And that's one of the primary ways of differences. And we as Christians must seek ways to implement these principles in our lives. We must seek ways for the Bible to speak to us and for the Holy Ghost to lead us and, and make us more separated unto Him. Now, our commitment must be what the Bible declares and not what is considered socially or culturally acceptable altogether. And the world will not embrace these principles, and this forces us to take stands on issues in order to preserve the biblical stance, what the Bible says. And I'm telling you what, if y'all think I'm nuts for teaching this stuff that I teach, and some people may not like it, and, and I feel it when it rises up, and it doesn't make any difference because I pray for the Lord to give me courage to go ahead and preach it, but if you pay any attention to the news the last few days we ain't the crazy ones now come on give me a break you got a fella that decides he wants to be a woman got a white lady decides she wants to be a black lady and now today I found out we got one that decides she don't want to be nothing She don't want you to say she or he to her. She wants you to say them, there, or us. And she's very, very famous. 
Some of you may let your children watch your videos and stuff. Uh, Hannah Montana, Miley Cyrus. That came out today. We ain't crazy, folks. Now let me, let me tell you something. We ain't crazy. And what this Bible teaches, Brother Pete, is actually what's normal. I, I feel like, Brother Rice, that the world is preaching my message for me. Come on now. And the, you know, the crazy thing is, Sister Betty, they ain't joking. How many of y'all remember Mad Magazine? Y'all remember Mad Magazine? They're doing stuff now in real life that they used to make fun of in Mad Magazine. You know, they're, they're doing things now that you read in The Onion. How many of you ever read The Onion before? The Onion News, that's just off the wall stuff. They're, they're doing things now, Brother Terry, that you want to look and see where's the little onion sign at because there's got to be something to it. You know, the world is not ever going to embrace a godly style of living because the world is on a journey away from God. That's very clearly defined in the Bible. The world is not going to uh, embrace it. You're never going to find yourself the coolest guy in school or on the job. You're not going to be a trendsetter. It ain't happening. But you shouldn't. If you're full of the Holy Ghost, you shouldn't want it to happen. The world will not embrace these principles, but we have to take stands to, to preserve the biblical mandates that are handed down to us. We're not talking about uh, maintaining a dress like Queen Elizabeth or in the Victorian era, nor are we suggesting that we dress plain or shabby or just in black and white to make a statement, but we're talking about being pleasing unto God and, and living a lifestyle that is set apart or holy and respectful in society, respectful to ourselves, and pleasing unto God. The implementation of these principles may vary from culture to culture. And you know my catchphrase, you know, the, everybody in here has looked at National Geographic before, and you see people of other cultures that are half-dressed or, or maybe the women just dressed from the waist up. And, and you know something, Brother Pete, as we mission or evangelize those areas, one of the first things we begin to teach them is to cover yourself up. But we ain't living on the outback of Australia. We're not living in the jungles of the Amazon. We live in the United States of America. Just like somebody might, the first thing you might want to say when you start talking about separation, well, what about kilts? What about them? You know, we don't live in Scotland. Okay? And they are very clearly gender distinctive. Very clearly. I had Scotch ancestors myself. That, that is an argument that's based out of ignorance. Brother Robbie. Two mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you don't see folks wearing them very much. Maybe in a, a Scottish parade somewhere. Or someone holding on to their Scottish ancestry. Or maybe Glen Campbell playing, playing the bagpipes. But. The point is to dress in a manner that is respectful in society, respectful to yourself, and to be holy unto God. And we do not have the option of neglecting these principles. Rather, we have to seek as led by the scripture, how can I implement these principles in my world? I'll tell you, just, this is just a personal thing. And you know well if you read our requirements for leadership. I, kinda, I, ain't, I ain't brought them out here tonight because I laid them up here last time and somebody came and laid all their papers beside them. So I had that letter from the Baptist youth pastor and the requirements for leadership and somebody who didn't want to go look at their papers when they got home. So I ain't bring them out there tonight. I don't, I don't want them back. We don't have the option of neglecting these principles. But, but I do not teach that, uh, uh, that everybody's got to wear long sleeves. Okay? Uh, this, this is a personal deal with me. I don't ever wear short sleeves to church. Ever. Now, I do wear short sleeves out. But if, if, you, you know, if I wanted to show you my, my farmer's tan that i got going on, they're all the way down to about right here, generally. Okay? I, I, I don't preach that, you, that you, everything's got to be long sleeve. You know, of course, Brother McKinney's always wore sleeves all the way down. And, and, and the church, and, and I, went to, I was telling Sister Nadine about this the other day, and I'm talking about seeking ways to implement these principles. And 
I was at camp meeting one time, Sister Leanne, so I decided that I was just going to go casual. And I wore a pair of nice pants and I wore a polo shirt. Well, every time I went to raise my hands up, they come plumb up down to here. I'm kind of a big fella, you know, and they don't make clothes fit big fellas right. You know, unless you got look like something from Omar the tent maker that you put on you. But every time I went to raise my hands up, my shirt clumb all the way, climbed all the way up my arm. And it, I couldn't even raise my hands. And I don't want to go to church when I can't worship. So I left right out of that service, walked across the street, bought me a brand new shirt off the rack. Put it back on, walked into church, and I was fine. Say, what's that got to do with anything? What that's got to do with is I, I want to be pleasing to God. I felt uncomfortable. And let me tell you something. I don't want to feel that way. Now, you know, you know well that, you know, like I said, our, our, our standards are, are very clear, you know. But, hey, I, I want the Holy Ghost to, to quicken me, Brother Manning. I want the Holy Ghost to direct me, even if it hurts my feelings. Because I want to be right. If there's anything that we teach during this time or, or elsewhere you don't agree with, but you feel that God is blessing you and you feel God is leading you in the right direction, please don't stop coming to church. Please don't. And if anybody makes you feel, now there's a difference. There's a difference in somebody making you feel bad or making you feel ashamed and the Holy Ghost correcting you. And if the Holy Ghost starts correcting you, don't try to blame it on nobody else. I just went there. Because we like a lot of time to try to find somebody to blame. It might be the Lord pecking on top of your head. But everybody's welcome to come worship. Everybody knows the rule. So now we're going to do a little talking. I'm, I also said this last week, and I want you to, uh, to uh, please receive it. There are many types and shadows and allegories that the Bible gives us where it uses some pretty strong language. And in no way am I suggesting anybody that dresses like this is a harlot or a whore or a prostitute or anything like that. And the Bible uses all those words except prostitute. The prostitute's cleaned up word. It does not... Most folks that you see out on the street, when you go to the mall, most of them are just dressing and living the way that culture has mandated. They didn't wake up in the morning and say, let me dress so I can be a disappointment to the Lord. Okay, they did not. It's just what culture mandates. But as we strive to be more like the Lord, we'll find out there are ways of behavior, of dress, of attitude, etc. that I got to change if I want to be pleasing to God. You know, just something as simple. There's certain words you cannot say and still be pleasing to God. You can't say them. Derogatory, hurtful, name-calling will never be right in the eyes of God, ever. Ever. So, I want to do a little comparing and contrasting. It's actually, believe it or not, on the very last page. I made it almost all the way through last week. We're going to compare and contrast some typology that's given in the book of Revelation. And it's not talking about literal people, but it's making an example of what is the world and what is the Lord. What is the, the, uh, the bride of the world or the bride of the devil, so to speak, and what is the bride of Christ. Revelation 17 and 1 says, There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that setteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. So you see the type and shadow there. It's not talking about sexual activity. It's talking about who we have lent our life to. You see that right there? We're not, we're not talking about individuals. We're talking about a type. Okay? Y'all feeling me? Oh, Lord, going to be a while tonight. Okay. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. 
Anytime that the Lord began to speak of his people turning his back, Brother David, he, he referred to the marital relationship or, or to inappropriate sexual relationship because that's something that everybody can relate with. And so when they would begin to serve other gods, they were committing adultery against the Lord. Okay, do, does that make sense to you? That's the, type, that's the word and typology that they use because everybody understands how that feels. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman set up on a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. So, you see the description of what is called uh, the adorning of the harlot, the great harlot or the great whore, which is a type of the world. Okay? Now, the adorning of the bride, Brother Rice, which is a type of the church, is like this, Revelation 19, 7 and 8. said, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, that's the church, the bride of Christ, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So now we've got two pictures. Right? right. Okay. Let me tell you something. If I ever start being a sissified preacher, that's when you need to get mad at me. Don't get mad at me for shooting truth. Okay? Don't get mad at me for preaching the Bible as true as what it is. Okay? If I turn into a sissy and start saying everybody's all right, everybody's saved, y'all better get mad at me. But do you see the compare and the contrast? One is the bride of Christ. Okay? Please understand, this is not saying, this is not saying that the only thing we can do is wear white and nothing else. Doesn't say that wearing purple or scarlet is bad. But you see the, the, the uh, 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 pictorial word uh, picture that has been painted of the great prostitute or the great whore. Come on now, y'all know what somebody dresses like that because you all said it before. She dressed like a streetwalker. You know how they dress. I've seen them before. I used to live down by New Orleans. They might be boys and they might be girls. But there ain't no doubt what they're selling. And then there's the bride. The clean, pure, white, and holy apparel. D -d Does that make sense to you? This leads to our next area of coverage and final area of coverage, at least for this series of lessons. Adornment and ornamentation. The word adorn in the Bible means to beautify or decorate with ornaments. The Greek word, this is kind of neat, the Greek word is kosmeo, K-O-S-M-E-O, from which we derive our English word cosmetics. Very good. It comes from the root word cosmos, which is translated world, also has the meaning of order, arrangement, or decoration. Thus, just as the attractive and orderly arrangement of the stars adorns the world, so humans can adorn themselves. But the apostles make it clear that the way women often desire to adorn themselves is in direct opposition to the way that God would desire it. There's a really good, really, really good allegory can be made there of, of him creating and ordering the, the world in the way that he wants it to. And then when we pray, Sister Maria, we are in fact asking the Lord to order our steps. So the whole world functions. Y'all heard me talk about this. The whole world, the animal kingdom and the, the planets and all of that function the way that God wanted them to. The only one that's got out of whack is man. Our text verses are two very clear passages. We're going to refer to them quite often in the New Testament that deal with adornment and apparel for Christian women. 
Both Paul and Peter expressed similar admonitions. Thus the standards of the first century apostolic church become clear to us even through a casual study. Christianity was born into the Roman world of luxury and decadence and it was in this context that apostolics were called to live their faith. So, let's talk a little bit about jewelry. Jewelry was originally a blessing from God. I, I watched a message by Brother Arnold today, uh, and I know Sister Kessler shared one with us by Brother Stone King, and I know there's been some folks looking for it. Let me tell you something. You're going through a trial, you need to get on there. This is my second time watching it, and I'm not necessarily going through a trial other than to know how to deal with people. But uh, uh, Brother Arnold preaches a message that I will not die in my dilemma, and it will rock your world. It's a tremendous message. I will not die in my dilemma. And you, he got snookered out of $800,000 at his church. And, uh, and the Lord ended up fixing all that for him. But it's a, it's a wonderful message. But, but he said, he talked about this. Abraham was wealthy in silver and gold. And God even instructed Israel to take the jewelry of the Egyptians on the night they were freed from bondage. So Pharaoh went as far as from telling the children of Israel, you can't go. To paying them to leave. That's what, kind of what happened. Because the, the children of Israel decided to leave. And the, he told the Egyptians bring all kinds of jewels and jewelry and give it to them. Now it wasn't that he wanted them to wear it necessarily. Though they did at that time. But this was a blessing from God. Because brother Robbie it was gold and silver. They was fresh out of greenbacks in those days. So it was jewelry and gold and precious stones that was the currency of the day with which to survive on their journey. Now until this time, jewelry was viewed positively because of its practical function. It had value. That was the purpose of jewelry was value. However, a disturbing trend was developing among God's people as they began to use their ornaments as an expression of pride and even of sensuality. Here's the sexual thing coming in again. You you turn people loose and, and get away from God, and it's crazy how fast they'll go to some kind of perverted sex thing. Y'all scared to say amen? Afraid they might tell off something on you. Like somebody might say, I wonder what they've been doing. This development helps us to understand why in the Old Testament, God, when God began to call his people to repentance... He would ask them to remove their jewelry, remove their ornaments. In Exodus 32 and 33, it came to a crisis point because it's a familiar story that you, you learn in Sunday school. Moses went on top of Mount Sinai in order to end up getting the Ten Commandments, and he stayed gone too long. If I remember correctly, he was gone 40 days. And, and he stayed gone too long, Brother Pete. And the, the children of Israel came to Aaron and said, uh, He's dead or something. He split the country on us. We want you to make us a, an image so we can worship it. And Brother David, it just so happened to be a cow, which is something they learned in Egypt. Because cattle were holy under the Egyptians. And so you know what they did? Is they took that jewelry that God had, the Egyptians had given them. And God had given them to help pay the way to the promised land. And they took that jewelry and gave it to Aaron. He melted it down and formed a golden calf. So Israel turned a blessing into an idol. And that'll preach by itself. Happens later on in the book of Judges. You find out in, the, in Gideon's story. It happens yet again. It's happened many times. It happened with the, with the, 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 the brazen serpent. They tried to make a god out of it. But they had turned into idols the most valuable gifts God had given them. So when Moses went up the mountain to plead with God to forgive them of their sin, he reassured Moses that he would keep his covenant with Israel to bring them into the land of Canaan. But the Lord says here, and this is something really neat to study, and I think you would have read it when you were going through the bread. The Lord said, I'm not going to go with them. Because if I go with them, my holiness and their unholiness will collide and they'll all die. So I'm going to let them go 
Excuse me. I'm going to let them go, but they're going to go by themselves. So when Israel learned, they played dumb a lot, I think, but they weren't really all that dumb. Because when Israel learned what God had said, Brother McKinney, when he said, you can go, but I'm not going with you, they immediately begin to do what they always did, repent. 